The Cavalcade of America, presented by DuPont. This evening, the DuPont Cavalcade brings the story of Francis Scott Key and how he composed the Star-Spangled Banner. Our national anthem, a tune that has inspired during the early days of our country and will always remain in the hearts of generations of Americans. DuPont, a company identified with the earliest days of our nation, presents the Cavalcade of America in an earnest endeavor to contribute something of permanent value and enjoyment to radio listeners, and also as a tribute to the research chemists in DuPont laboratories whose ideals are so well expressed by the phrase, Better things for better living through chemistry. The DuPont Cavalcade moves forward. in Frederick County, Francis Scott Key was born on August 1st, 1779. His father was John Ross Key, his mother, Anne Dagworthy Charlton. One of his young neighbors was a little girl who, like himself, was to contribute poetic, legendary renown to our country's flag, Barbara Fritchie. As our story opens, Francis is 12 years old. He and Barbara and his sister Anne are on the veranda of the sedate Key Mansion at Terra Rubra, a sunshiny day in July. <laughs> what you children doing out here? Didn't your pappy done told you all not to play on this here veranda today? Come on now, you all scared. Oh, listen, Mammy. We're not playing here. Only sitting on the steps watching the soldiers on the lawn and, and waiting for General Washington to come out. We'll be as quiet as mice, won't we, Barbara? And right, Mammy. We will. And besides, Mammy... Father wants us to help with the sermon this afternoon. I don't think he'd mind if we sat here very quietly doing General Washington's speech. Now, do you really, really, Mammy, think so? Master Frankie, you and your sister Anne, and you too, Miss Barbara Fitchie, won't be the death of me yet. All right, then. You can stay out here. Oh, oh, no. But remember, no time fool with. I've got plenty to do without having you free off my hands. And I better stir myself and do it. In case if I don't, things won't get done, that's all. Thanks. Hey. Do you know something? What now? Well, I was thinking that when General Washington finishes his speech, the three of us ought to go up and present him with something. Yes, but... But what? Let's pick some of these honeysuckle and magnolia that grow up at the veranda. Yes, we'll do that. You can give them to him, Frankie. Me? Well, not. That's a girl's job. Oh, but you can say something much nicer than we can. Come on, Anne. Let's start picking the bouquet. All right. Yes, but, but why should I have to do all... Here comes General Washington with your father now. Look, the officers and men have put on their hats with the cockades of the Continental Army. Oh, they love him, don't Great. they? Of course they do. Shh. My countrymen, I am delighted to greet you in the midst of this beautiful Maryland countryside. But before I depart, I want to thank you and the people of Frederick County for the devotion and support I have always received from you. And now... I must be on my way. So once again, accept my gratitude and farewell. God bless you all. Three cheers for General Washington. Hooray! 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 Here's the bouquet, Frankie. Come on, let's go up and give it to General Washington. All right, give it to me. Now I really want to present it. Remember, we're going to stand beside you, Frankie. Go ahead now. Go ahead. Gen General Washington... General Washington, 
Washington. Yes? We, we've gathered these flowers for you as a, a token of Marilyn's love for you. And, and so, so we present them to you. Here. Thank you. A very pretty speech, my lad. And a very pretty bouquet, too. Barbara and I picked the flowers, General Washington. Well, that's mighty nice all around. Are all these children yours, uh, Lieutenant Key? No, not all of them, I'm sorry to say, General Washington. This is Barbara Fritchie, and this is my daughter, Anne. How do you do, General? Well, I'm delighted to meet such lovely girls. And this is my son, General Washington, my son, Francis Scott Key. How do you do, sir? In the shadows of the verdant Maryland hills, beside the flashing crystal of its sparkling brooks, the boy Francis Scott Key grew to manhood. On January 19, 1802, he married Mary Lloyd and moved to Georgetown, where he entered into law partnership with his uncle. On one occasion, when they returned to his father's house, the Keys serve a banquet on the veranda of the mansion for their friends, Dr. Beans and Roger Brook Tawney. Well, dining on the veranda is unusual, but the occasion warrants it, I think. It was a charming idea, Mrs. Key. I'm sure I speak for all your guests. Well, Dr. Beans indeed speaks for all of us, Mary. The news that Stephen Decatur routed the pirates at Tripoli demands a festive celebration of some sort. Wasn't it wonderful, though, Francis? It must have been wonderful, Mary. When Roger Brook Tawney agrees... To any kind of unusual procedure, it must have been wonderful. <laughs> There's a faint sentiment of amusement in your tone, Frank, which I find myself wholly unable to support. <laughs> <laughs> Spoken like the true lawyer and the great judge I'm sure you're going to be someday. Someday? I'm not a judge, of course, but I'm trying to be a lawyer now. Did you two ever stop teasing each other? Did you ever see the like of a Dr. Bean? Oh, pay no attention to them, Miss Key. Roger Bokes and Tawny finds himself on the Supreme Court yet. I'm sure of that. And so is Francis down deep. Oh, Francis, look. The field hands are coming across the lawn. Well, of course they are, my dear. I've asked them to sing for us. Oh, Splendid. Oh, Their singing is hear. famous all over Maryland. I know. You want us to sing now, Marquis? Yes. Now, listen, everybody. Oh, nobody knows the trouble I see. Nobody knows but Jesus. Oh, nobody knows the trouble I've seen. Glory, hallelujah. Sometimes I'm up, sometimes I'm down. Oh, yes, Lord. Sometimes I'm old. Beautiful. Yes. Simply beautiful. Nice. Yes, so it was. Well, how do you know, Frank? You were scribbling on an envelope all during the singing. Oh, Frank. I couldn't help it. I I fell to thinking about Stephen Decatur's victory, and I made up a little verse about it. Would you like to hear it? Oh, sure yes, was, yes. Frank. By all means, Mr. Key. Let us hear the verse you've written. I wonder, do you all know the old tune to an acreon in heaven? Of course, you remember, yes, Frank. Yes. We used to sing in college all the time. To an acron in heaven where he sat in full glee, a few sons of harmony sent a petition that he there inspired and patron would be. When his answer arrived from the jolly old Grecian. <laughs> Dear, who was in that Well, he was a Greek poet, my darling. And after his death, his 
fellow poet set him up as a kind of demigod. I think Frank is one of his disciples. <laughs> well, I've just written a few lines commemorating our victory at Tripoli, which may be sung to that air. Uh, here are the words. You sing it, Rod. I'll try. Our fathers who stand on the summit of fame shall exultingly hear of their sons the proud story. How pale beam the crescent, its splendor obscured by the light of the star-spangled flag of our nation. Oh, star-spangled flag. That's good, Mr. Key. That's a fine description of our national banner. Yes, it has a glitter to it, Francis. Well, thanks. I, I fancied it myself. Go on, Roger. Finish it. By the light of the star-spangled flag of now, uh, our nation. Now, don't change the key, Roger. Well, <laughs> it's a hard tune to sing, even if it is one of my favorites. Now, let me finish it anyway. By the light of the star-spangled flag of our nation. In the full tide of song, let their fame roll along. To the feast flowing board, let us gratefully throng. Come on, now, everybody, gather around so you can see the words. Yes. Now, all together. <laughs> when mixed with the olive, the Lord shall wave. Ten years before he wrote the words that were to bring him fame, Francis Scott Key was already composing verses to the tune that was to become our national anthem and using the phrase, Star-Spangled Flag. Continuing the practice of law, Key distinguished himself on many occasions before Chief Justice John Marshall and the United States Supreme Court. Then came the night of August 24th, 1814, one of the darkest hours in American history when the British burned the city of Washington. Key's wife, Mary, and his sister, Anne, now married to Roger Ring Tawney, worried at the absence of their husbands, watched with frightened eyes from the windows of the Key home in Georgetown across the bay of the Potomac River. Oh, I'm frightened, Anne. I'm so worried. So am I. Mary, I've tried to assure myself that we'd hear if anything were wrong. Listen, what? Are those hoofbeats or is that my imagination? Oh. Somebody's riding up the road to the house. I hear two horses. We can't tell who it might be. Here. Take this musket, in. All right. Don't be afraid to use it. Francis! Roger! Hey! Oh, Francis. 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 What are you doing Francis. with that gun? You're oh, safe. Oh, 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 of course I'm safe here. Oh, now, there, there. You <laughs> mustn't cry. Francis, if anything happened to you, we've been watching the fire so long here. <clears throat> Where are the president and Mrs. Madison? Well, the president escaped and the cabinet in flight. And Mrs. Madison barely had time to save a portrait of Washington before Coburn's Marines burned the White House. Francis, Everybody's left the city. Well, are we safe here? Well, I hope so. Oh, I was never so tired in all my life. Oh, sit down over here. Right by me, dear. Uh, there, ride. now. Uh, what's that? Well, I'll have a look out the window. Frank! I can see a whole crowd, a mob of people coming up the road. The British? No, they've marched with drums and martial music. Well, let's go out on the porch and find out what's up. All right. Yeah, be careful now. Be careful. Be careful. Uh, don't be afraid. It's our people. Hey there. Any one of you. Where are you going? We're heading over to Baltimore. Our homes are all afire. We've got to get out of Washington. You better come with us. No time to wait. We're going to rally at Baltimore and make a stand at Fort McHenry. <laughs> Is that you, Colonel Skinner? Yes, Mr. Key, you'd better join us. Isn't there any safety here? Not a chance. Is that cannon, Colonel Skinner? No, Mrs. Key. That's thunder. There's a storm brewing. Well, come on inside, all of you. Out of the rain. And let the British catch us. Not us. Yes, what is it? Word from the capital, sir. The British are on their way to capture Dr. Bean. Dr. Bean? Why, he's an old friend of ours. What for? Oh, they say he had some of the British soldiers arrested. 
They're going to make an example of him. Colonel Skinner, the doctor's an old man. We've got to stop them. You're right, Keith. Oh, but Francis, you can't go. Oh, please, uh, not in all this storm. But, but who's going to look after us here? Didn't you hear them say that it wasn't safe to stay here? Get me my great coat, Mary. Roger, take the girls over to the old mansion at Terra Rubra. What? They'll be safe there. Yeah, but Frank... We oh, haven't time to argue, Roger. Please do as I say. Go, Goodbye, Mary. I'll be back as soon as I can. Oh, Francis. Galloping off into the storm toward the flaming horizon of the burning city of Washington sped Francis Scott Key. Too late, he and Colonel John Skinner reached the home of Dr. Bean, found the place deserted with mute evidence of the doctor's capture. And so, after conferring with the Secretary of War, James Monroe, the two men embarked under the flag of truce for His Majesty's ship Tona, flagship of Admiral Coburn's fleet, drawn up to lay siege to Fort McHenry. We find them discussing the matter of Dr. Bean's release with the Admiral in his cabin. <clears throat> Gentlemen, I'm of the opinion that instead of permitting Dr. Bean to go, I should have the scoundrel hang from my yard arm. You know he urged a group of townsmen to throw some of our British soldiers into jail. But don't you realize that those men were behaving in a most outrageous fashion? That their actions were a disgrace to the British uniform? They weren't soldiers that day. They were marauders. Admiral Coburn. The Beans only took precautionary measures, Admiral. That's absolutely all. And I think, sir, you ought to show some leniency in this matter in view of the doctor's impartial treatment of British wounded as well as Americans. The man is old, Admiral. And unless outrageously provoked, I would say is the most peaceful of our citizens. Well, as I see it, we gain little by holding Dr. Bean. All right, gentlemen, I'll see that he's released. Thank you, Admiral Coburn. Then we'll return to shore at once. As to that, I'm afraid it will be most unwise, Mr. Key. We must take all steps to prevent any information about our position here, naturally. You must have observed certain preparations on deck... Yes, we couldn't help noticing a certain activity. Yes, quite so. That's why I'm going to detain you during the bombardment of Fort McHenry. I'll transfer you both and Dr. Beans to my son's ship surprise for the duration of the attack. You will be put ashore after we capture Baltimore. Capture Baltimore? Aren't you taking a lot for granted, Admiral? Where you're standing, Mr. Key, you can easily see out that, that portal there. Yes? Well, perhaps you can see that flag over the battlements of Fort McHenry. Yes. Looks rather proud flying there in the sunset. Well, Mr. Key, proud as it may look to you now, tomorrow morning you won't see that banner over the fort. So take a good last look at it. <laughs> Quietude of sunset, Key, Skinner, and Dr. Beans rode through the purpling waters of the harbor to the British ship Surprise. And as the sun dipped beneath the horizon, the Americans standing near a gunnel began a lonely vigil to watch their country's flag. The British frigates reeled as broadside after broadside thundered across the harbor, lighting the night with fire. Then, sometime before dawn, on the morning of September 14, 1814, Silence fell over the harbor. Can it be that the fort held out? I don't see how it could. That was a terrific cannonade. I've strained my eyes pretty nearly out of their sockets all night, trying to see that flag. I couldn't see it at all. I could see it once in a while through my telescope. If the fort falls, what do you suppose they'll do to us? I'm not thinking what it'll mean to us. I'm wondering what it'll mean to the United States. Washington burned... Baltimore in the hands of the enemy. You don't even suggest it, Skinner. We have to face the facts, man. The bombardment seems to have stopped. Perhaps they've captured the fort. No. Perhaps the British have given up. If that flag is still waving, we have it lost. And I won't lose hope. I wish I had your optimism, Francis. Seems to be getting lighter. Yes. It's the dawn. Now we'll know. I can see the fort now, I think. Yes, come over to the rail. Look there, Key. Uh, how about the flag? Give me your telescope, Skinner. I'll see for myself. Yes. 
Yes, it's there. It's still flying. The fort's held out. The attack on Fort McHenry had failed. Key and his companions went ashore. After they separated, Key went to a hotel where he perfected certain notes he had taken, fashioning them into the ringing verses of the Star-Spangled Banner. Before the day was out, handles of the poem circulated throughout Baltimore. And late that night in an old inn near the Holiday Street Theater in Baltimore... <laughs> Everything's going to be all right now as long as Baltimore is safe. Yes, I guess we showed when we went business at McHenry. Yes. Say, any of you boys see one of them handbills about the flag? Oh, no, I saw one this morning. morning. What handbill? Well, where you been all day, stranger? Well, I just got in town this afternoon. I didn't see any handbills about the flag. Well, somebody's written a powerful poem about our flag. Here, I got a copy of it right here in my hey, pocket. Show it to him, oh, Tim. All right. I'll Let me read it, it to you. It's called The Defense of Fort McHenry. Yeah. And here's a foreword printed at the top of the handbill. Listen, uh, listen, will you, everybody? Listen just a minute. The uh, next song was composed under the following circumstances. A gentleman had endeavored, under a flag of truce, to obtain the release of a friend of his from the British fleet. He was not permitted to return, lest the intended attack on Baltimore should be disclosed and was compelled to witness the bombardment of Fort McHenry. He watched the flag at the fort through the night with an anxiety that can be better felt than described by the light of the bombshells. And at early dawn, his eye was again greeted by the proudly waving flag of his country. Oh, I see, and the poem follows, eh? Yes. Yeah. see it. Oh, say, can you see... Yes, it can be sung to the tune of Anacreon in heaven. You know that song they've been singing so long around the colony. Sure, everybody knows the tune. I used to hear my father sing it. They used to sing it in England. Yes, the author must have known it. The rhythm of the words uh, fits the tune perfectly. Free and the home of the brave. That's great. What a poem. Say, who wrote this anyway? Yes, we all noticed that. The author didn't sign his name. Must be a pretty modest fellow, huh? Well, if I had written anything as fine as that, you can bet your boots I'd sign my name. Yeah, well, one of the soldiers at McHenry told me a fellow named Key wrote the poem. Key? I wonder who he is. Key, I know him. He's a oh, lawyer. Oh, Great yes, fellow, Frank Key. He took a case of mine once, but I couldn't get him to let me pay a fee. <laughs> That's the man, all right. Captain Nicholson over at the fort knows him well. Sort of a relative of his. Well, I right. sure like to shake his hand. Well, you can. He just came in the inn. See him over there talking to Ferdy Durang? Well, I wish we could get him to stop at our table here. The only way to do it is to ask him. Uh, Mr. Key. Yes? Oh, hello, Taylor. I do. You all know Ferdinand Durang, don't you? Oh, yes. yes. Uh, Mr. Key. Yeah? Will you answer a question for us? Well, if it doesn't incriminate me. <laughs> no, this one won't. Did you write that poem about the flag? The one on all those handbills? If I answer the question, will you all do something for me? Why, yes, yes, well, well. All right, then. I did. Well, well certainly, certainly wonderful, Mr. Key. Now, um, here's what I want to ask you to do. I've never heard it sung. Well, uh, gentlemen. Uh, gentlemen, Mr. Francis Scott Key is with us tonight. We've just found out from him that he wrote the poem about our flag. He watched it during the attack on McHenry. What do you say we all sing it for him? Uh, Ferdinand Durang is our best singer, so he'll lead it. And we'll all join in the refrain. Joe, you play the fiddle. All right, Ferdy, get up on that chair and sing us the song of the Star-Spangled Banner. Oh, can you see by the dawn? And 
of the people of this country to our flag is no better symbolized than in the fervent stanzas of the Star Spangled Banner. More than a century has elapsed since it was written, but it has always remained in the hearts of American citizens as the official national anthem, although it wasn't until March 3rd, 1931, that it was so designated by a special act of Congress. Francis Scott Key died January 11th, 1843. Fort McHenry became a national shrine, and on the 100th anniversary of the composition of the Star-Spangled Banner, a red, white, and blue boy was anchored in Baltimore Harbor near the spot where the song was written. This evening, DuPont pays tribute to our national flag and to the ever-living memory of the patriot who immortalized it in the Star-Spangled Banner, Francis Scott Key, inspiring leader in the cavalcade of America. <laughs> Moving from the past to the present, we quote from a recent newspaper item. Fort Madison, Iowa, a new manufacturing unit to supply the Midwest area with paints, enamels, and industrial finishes will soon be put into operation here by the DuPont Company. And here is still another newspaper announcement. San Francisco, California. The South San Francisco paint and varnish plant of the DuPont Company, which started operations here two years ago, is being expanded by the erection of additional buildings. And so it goes, another industry moving forward. More jobs being created in plants built to make new and better finishes for America's needs. And behind it all is the work of the research chemist. From fine lacquers for dolls and vanity cases to paints for homes and the rugged duco and dulux finishes required for automobiles, locomotives, and ocean liners, that's the range of finishes now made by DuPont. Twenty years ago, DuPont had only one paint plant. Today, seven DuPont plants in seven cities are making finishes for every purpose. These plants are really local industries, manned by local people and serving territorial needs. That they exist today and employ thousands and are still expanding is due largely to constant chemical improvement. DuPont finishes are tested in laboratories, on outdoor exposure farms, and in actual use under all conditions to ensure their resistance to the severest kind of punishment. And in many cases, increased demand and improved manufacturing methods have enabled DuPont to maintain its policy of passing savings through cost reductions along to the consumer. This means more factories and more employment, which helps everybody in the country. It also means new and improved products at constantly lower prices. This is what the DuPont company means by its pledge Better things for better living through chemistry. The story of Oliver Wendell Holmes, a portrait of an American poet, physician, scientist, and humorist, will be the subject of our broadcast when next week, at the same time, DuPont again presents The Cavalcade of America. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System.